Hey there, y'all. Well, this is going to be part four of the irksome subject. And uh, there we go. Certainty of the words. Right here. And I think we're on page. Yeah, page 36, so we got 32 more pages to go. Oh, they got a popo, doing something. But anyway, I don't know if it's going to be like four, three, three more parts to this, I'm not sure. And once I find out how many parts it is, I'll name it 102, 106, 107, you know, whatever. 2 of 7, 3 of 7, 4 of 7, 5 of 7, if it's 7 parts. Anyway, um, I don't know how far I'm getting with this. I don't know if anybody likes this. I don't know if anybody appreciates it. The best thing to do is read um, Kyle Stevens' book and find out for yourself. And uh, I should have got some water for this. Chinese restaurant. Sometimes eating that food, so it can be a little salty and it kind of makes you dry mouth. But um, anyway, I'm over here at LN Depot in Etowah facing the trains. They don't seem to be moving, they're just standing still, not bumping or carrying on or nothing. I guess they're done for tonight. Uh, it's wet, it's a little chilly. Anyway, so here we go. I'm gonna try to make it a little less than 25 minutes this time around. But I was trying to do that yesterday, but it wound up being 28. Um, anyway, it was starting up um, reading off from uh, yesterday. Um, it says, in another of his undeniably profound works, the King James Version defended Dr. Hills, Dr. Hills makes a very impassioned, <clears throat> very learned, and very inspiring argument in defense of the AV. But once again, batters his foot against the stumbling stone of translation. He acknowledges the providential guidance of the AV translators and remonstrates that for retaining the present form of the King James Bible. But again, he makes a disturbing concession, saying, Hence we receive the King James Version as the providentially appointed English Bible. Admittedly, this venerable version is not absolutely perfect, but it is trustworthy. That makes absolutely no sense. That's my opinion. In the next paragraph, it continues along this line. It is possible, if the Lord tarry, that in the future the English language will change so much that a new English translation of the Bible will be absolutely, absolutely necessary. Early in the book, again in the same vein, he elaborates on the archaic words. There are several ways to handle this matter of obsolete words and meanings in the King James Version. Perhaps the best way is to place the modern equivalent in the margin. Another way would be to place the more modern word in brackets beside the older word. Most King James Bible believers are accustomed enough to marginal notes in various publications of the King James Bible to understand that they are opinions of man, whether they are correct or incorrect. However, should the matter of archaic words be dealt with as Hills suggests secondly, suggests it secondly, placing the up-to-date word beside the archaic word within the scriptural text. Most every believer who venerates the scriptures knows that the, this act, that that action would be an invasion of sacred territory. It definitely would be. The very text of the Holy Scripture, again, it is 
regrettable to hear such a valuable contributor to the Bible's cause yields such important ground. In this noble and worthwhile argument on why the King James should be retained in our modern world, Dr. Hills enumerates six things which are all very good points, yet in his sixth reason he says, The King James Version is the historic Bible of the English-speaking Protestants. Upon it, God, working providentially, has placed the stamp of his approval through the usage of many generations of Bible-believing Christians. Hence, if we believe in God's providential preservation of the Scriptures, we will retain the King James Version, for in doing so we will be following the clear leading of the Almighty. Granted, Dr. Hills did not intend for the final of his six reasons to stand alone as an all-sufficient reason to retain the King James, however, pounding the pulpit for his historicity's sake while actually denying the argument for perfection's sake is not exactly the soul-stirring trumpet uh, call that boils the blood of the saints to do battle with it for the Lord. This is especially true when the Lord did actually and plainly go on the record as promising perfection. Dr. David Oldest Fuller is another defender of the King James Bible to whom many of us openly profess to owe a debt of gratitude for his great labor and manifest courage as a writer and editor. His works go quite hand in hand with the labors of Dr. Hills. He is much remembered for publishing edited works of textual experts who <clears throat> resolutely defended the AUV 1611 and the Hebrew and Greek texts from which it is translated. It is important to set forth at the very outset that after the publication of his works, Dr. Fuller, in personal conversation with Dr. Sam Gibb, another man who stands behind the King James, like Gail Ripplinger, as related to me by Dr. Gibb, revealed that he had advanced significantly beyond his published position and came to hold the King James Bible not merely as a faithful translation, <clears throat> but as the word, very word of God itself. A Bible believer's heart rejoices in this, but while his published works were of great important, import, there were again troublesome echoes of a discord to an attuned ear. <clears throat> Which Bible is not a repudiation of, scholar, repudiation of scholarship. It is not an argument for the inerrancy of a translation. It is a long overdue defense of the worth of the old authorized version. And the flyleaf is representative of Dr. Fuller's position of the height of his published, publishing career. The AV needed to be defended, but not, was not inerrant. Full, Fuller's then held position can be ascertained in the following. The reader is encouraged to maintain confidence in the King James Version as a faithful translation based upon a reliable text. We cannot help but notice Fuller's assessment that the King James is merely a faithful translation, and for that matter, that the text of the Greek is merely reliable. <clears throat> In his book, Which Bible, Fuller published a work by George Sales Bishop, a man who is very who was very critical of the English Revised Version of 1881, which of course began the avalanche of new versions, and which also provided a stage and a spotlight for the scripture altering atrocities of Westcott and Hort. Though defending the A.V., Bishop nonetheless exposes his own shaky foundation in saying, that a few changes might be made in both testaments of the King James for the better, no man pretend, pretends to deny. Bishop plainly is unopposed to changing certain portions of the New and Old Testament in the King James Bible. Reading Sir Robert Anderson, who was obviously appalled by the travesties of the RV of 1881, a Bible believer today knowing the kind 
of mileage Satan has gotten out of the issue must grind his teeth when Anderson says, But what concerns us here is not the changes in the translation of the AV, but the far more serious matter of the changes in the text, the Greek text. Anderson may have defended the King James in a measure, but he is not a troubled he is not as troubled by changes in it as he is in the changes of the Greek text. We are not for changing the Greek text by any means, but Anderson unwillingly shows us his lack of esteem for the AV in comparison to the Greek. Dr. Ben, Dr. Dr. Benjamin, Benjamin J. Wilkinson wrote Our Authorized Bible Vindicated which volume has become a mainstay in the battle for, for the King James and for the text of Receptus New Testament Greek text. The battle for the right Greek text was one of them that had to be fought, and we thank God for those who were engaged on that battlefield during the 19th and 20th centuries. But it is plain, it is painful to hear the acquiescence to the enemy that reads thus. The friends and devotees of the King James Bible naturally wished that certain retouches might be given to the book that would replace words counted obsolete, correct what they considered a few and clear blemishes in the received text, so that this is bitter, so that its bitter opponents might be answered. So they just want to change it a little bit just to shut them up. It is plain that Wilkinson can considered retouches to the AV, replacement of words, and correction natural. The learned Philip Morrow was a Supreme Court justice and a King James defender. He was on the Lord's side in respect to his Christianity and the Bible issue, and he, and he was thus a friend to our cause, but it became increasingly evident that notwithstanding the excellencies of that great and Admiral, Admiral work, Davy, and there were particulars wherein, for one cause or another, it admitted of, and indeed called for, correction. It was found also that corrections in translation were demanded here and there, particularly in regard to the tenses of verbs. <laughs> Unfortunately, Morrow's comments are self-explanatory to the real Bible-believing Christians. John W. Bergen is a name recognized by nearly all who have attempted to even scratch the surface of the King James issue. His well-deserved fame is not only for the excellence of scholarship, great power in authorship, and thorough defense of the received text of the AV 1611, but more especially for the head-to-head <coughs> -head battle he, that he fought with Westcott and Hort. Those appalling reprobates both attempted and frankly succeeded in commandeering the Revision Committee of 1881 into accepting a, accepting a debauched textual theory, grossly corrupt manuscripts, and eventually a perverted Bible text that has done Satan proud. Bergen, though a champion of the received text, disappoints in one respect. And it is also interesting to note that the aforementioned Edward Hill's introduction of the statement made by Bergen and his controversy with the revisionists of 1881, Bergen stood forth as the uncompromising champion of the King James Authorized Version, as a champion in the study and for private edification, as a book of reference for critical purposes, especially in respects of difficult and controverted passages. We hold that a revised edition of the authorized version of our English Bible, if executed with consummate ability and learning, would at any time be a work of esteemable, inest inestimable value. Bergen did go on to say that the idea of undertaking a translation in it to, intended to supersede the AV was not to be entertained. Hills clarifies that Bergen's purpose was to defend the Byzantine text of the AV. It is hoped that the reader might ascertain that this is a dangerous dance of semantics with the devil. First, an uncompromising championship of the King James Bible is not the exact same thing as championing the Texas Receptus. 
Truthfully, Bergen championed the TR, not the King James. Secondly, Bergen was quite open to a revision of the AV, but did not want the old superseded by the new. If it was not clear to this acknowledged old warehouse then, war then, it is perfectly clear to any clear-minded soul now that granting latter-day Bible creditors latitude to revise the King James Bible is the equivalent of giving them utter license to corrupt and pervert. It should further be stated that the, count the countenancing a Bible for private edification as a book of reference for critical purposes versus a Bible for a public and non-critical purposes is short-sighted, hypocritical, and smacks of the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Jasper James Ray um, Jasper James Ray soundly affected the faith of many in his book God Wrote Only One Bible copyrighted at first in 1955 his sister pamphlet The New, New Eye Opener is found tucked behind the front of the black Bible covers of countless Bible believers covers of Bible believers and it still passed on to many in inquire seeking light on the Bible version issue. An unquestioned help and a work of profound effect since in publication is still it still trumpets forth a sour note for someone who is not a Greek student, yet who still knows that the King James Bible emanates a power unexplicable by mere accurate translation, Ray says. The Bible Oh, translation of Ray says, The Bible God wrote has been providentially preserved for us in the Greek Texas Receptus, from which the King James Bible was translated in 1611. And a few pages later, he says, Help save our God-given Bible. Let's pray, plan, and work to pull together to help save our God-inspired Bible from the scrap heap of this modern hodgepodge of corrupt and revised Bibles. The Greek Texas receptors ought to be used in our Bible schools instead of the text of Westcott and Horton. <clears throat> it is plain that Ray held that the actual Bible that God wrote was the Greek Texas receptors of the New Testament and that in not the AV 1611 was the ultimate appeal. <clears throat> These above mentioned men these above mentioned men, having fought a good fight, had undoubtedly ascended to be present with the Lord, and are quite soon to receive the well-earned rewards. <clears throat> they are our brothers and our friends, and, our, and their laurels await the, the heavenly reunion. So let us move a bit forward in time and take just a sampling of a few of the contemporary defenders of the King James. After all, it is unlikely that even as a statue, sorry, after all, it is even unlikely that it, as a, stu a man as Burgeon could have quite predicted that uh, the expansive havoc and extensive damage wrought by the insidious philosophies that won the day in the RV Committee of 1881. Men residing in the late 20 and 21st and early 21st century have seen some things in the fulfillment that even Hills and Fuller could not fully predict. In his work, Touch Not the Unclean Thing, David Sorison writes that uh, in his work, Touch Not the Unclean Thing, David Sorensen writes what is a sound review of the material found in nearly all major 20th century works as testing to the historical and textual facts and characteristics of the Texas Receptus in the King James Bible. His position is not uncommon at all among all AV 1611 defenders, but he makes a point to distinguish his position, position from the following. The advocates of the King James only position have a, <laughs> have a severe problem. Most of them hold to the view that the King James Bible, the King James Version of 1611 as a translation, was inspired and thus has no need for further translation or revision. 
it probably should be mentioned that the King James Bible haters throw the King James only nomenclature at just about anyone who stands in disagreement with them in hopes that they will be scared away. <laughs> Not me. I don't even stick with that name. King James only. I'm not the onlyest. I mean, I, I go by one Bible, but I don't remember. Like he says, I'm a defender of the word. There are a lot of people who are onlyest in a lot of things, and I don't consider being King James Version the onlyest by, by name, particularly. The animal equivalent is that of a chihuahua. <laughs> Sorry, I read this before and it made me think about it. I remember how that made me laugh. The animal equivalent is that of a chihuahua when it hackles up. The opposing dog is humored but doesn't feel particularly threatened. Sorsen would be considered the King James only in many circles. In a later chapter, we will discuss the ramifications of whether it is so wrong to consider that something originally inspired might be still be inspired. To make a long story short, if all scripture was given by inspiration of God, 2 Timothy 3.16, and what you have in your hand is the scripture, then that is still inspired scripture. For all scripture was given by inspiration. For now, the main point is that yet another helpful voice in the battle for the AV 1611 obviously holds that the sanctity of the King James as translated is contest contestable. In the publication of Donald Blake's master's thesis, a reference by, as referenced by David Owens Fuller in Counterfeit or Genuine, Blake's final word of the doctrine of the preservation of the scriptures is to simply quote the Westminster Confession. The Old Testament in Hebrew and the New Testament in Greek being immediately inspired by God and by his singular care and providence kept pure in all ages are therefore turn the page authentical so as in all controversies of religion the church is finally to peel them. According to Brake, the church's final appeal is to Hebrew and Greek. Mainly, undoubtedly, many undoubtedly agree, but this is not what you mean when you magnify the King James Bible as the Word of God. Is this, but is that what you mean when you magnify the King James Bible as the Word of God? Floyd Nolan Jones wrote an excellent work called Which Version is the Bible? It is a very fine resource and exalts the AV 1611. He is consistent in this theme of exalting the King James Bible throughout the book and it is a shame to have mentioned to have to mention one disappointing junction where in discussing one of the great neck breakers in the King James Bible the archaic words he says there are only several hundred obsolete or archaic words remaining within the 1611 King James Bible. These few could and should be brought up to date. The eth endings could also easily be changed, although care must be taken as to which rendering, else many times the actual meanings may be lost. The idea that bringing up to date certain words, presumably several hundred, According to his statement, it could be done as latitude that cannot be granted. Indeed, uh, should be argued that a Christian would do well to elevate his vocabulary and reading comprehension instead of degrading the Word of God to his own level of ignorance and a lack of initiative. That's true. Keep the words you got. And increase your vocabulary. Knoweth, yeteth. Even unsaved people deepen their vocabularies for their careers and for financial gain. Should not Christians then broaden their vocabularies for their Savior? Now, speaking against uh, Cal Stevens, he spells Savior S A V I O R when it actually is S A V I O U R. So I have to point that out. 
Jones goes another disturbing step further, though, uh, through and states another step further, though, and states that the changing those words should be done. Jones, after suggesting that the F endings on verbs should be changed as well, does an odd thing and subsequently defends the AV's old-fashioned usage of pronouns like ye, thee, thou, thy, and thine as being much more accurate than the modern equivalents because they denote singulars and plurals. While he says the F endings have served a vital function in the AV, he seems strangely unresolved about the fact that the old verb endings are themselves a logical extension of the distinctive accuracy of the pronouns, and he leaves the door very much open for Bible-correcting camels to stick their nose through the door and to subsequently assume permanent residence. So, I'm stopping right there and read the rest of it later on. So, I hope you all enjoyed that. I'm sorry if I kind of stuttered through it, some of it. Um, sometime, I, like I said yesterday, I kind of got to get the get a hold of the sentence and stuff. Got to slow down, see how it's to be read and stuff, you know. Um, I don't know. I've always had that problem. I hope that's not going to put anybody off. Anyway, hope you enjoyed that. I'm going to go home and, um, yeah, probably do a couple other videos on something else. God bless. We'll see you all later.